Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. Just ahead on today's episode. Pam was so pretty without makeup. He was very nervous about being an actor. How about Jonathan Taylor Thomas? Jonathan just knew how to tell a joke. Chewbacca, Robin, Tattoo, Ed McMahon. Sidekicks in film and television are some of the most important roles to fill on a cast. And all are pivotal to the success of the show. In the 1990s, there was an unforgettable sidekick who hammered his way to fame on one of the most popular comedies of the decade. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Join me with today's guest from Home Improvement, Richard Karn. Would you tell me the story about the shoes? <laughs> yeah, how many guys have stories about shoes? Well, depending on the shoes, those are pretty... Well, they're hush puppies. They're worth talking about. They're hush puppies, and these are my Christmas shoes. I only wear them usually around Christmas. December. I, uh, December, but um, these were home improvement shoes. These shoes are over 30 years old. I would think. And you still fit in them? And I still I still fit in my shoes. <laughs> and the and the glue hasn't come apart or anything like that, but they were they were I think Al you know because plaid was was kind of his uh his armor. Uh he had plaid everything. I had a I had a plaid dinner jacket, a plaid cummerbunds, shoes, all just everything. Are the shoes the only thing that lasted? No, no. I still have a couple of the shirts. I still mm -hmm. have that. I still have that um, kind of dinner jacket, you know, with the shawl collar and, and everything. And I'll, I'll pull that out every once in a while <laughs> if I uh, if I need that. But I remember uh, um, going in for costume at the very beginning, and they had these Ralph Lauren fitted um, shirts, that, and they thought that they would go plaid because why not? And and I put it on, and it was fitted. And I go, you know, these these aren't that comfortable. And look at the price tag on this thing. It's like back in 1991, it was like $140 for a Ralph Lauren uh, plaid shirt. And I go, go to Eddie Bauer or, or go to uh, The Gap. They've got really comfortable plaid shirts, and they're $25. I'll save you some money. <laughs> Ted Knight, his character Ted Baxter on the old Mary Tyler Moore show used to say plaid was his favorite color. <laughs> <laughs> well, they got a lot of mileage out of that. I mean, we did a green screen thing where, where Tim painted plaid. He painted something plaid. And, and you know, when you put it on, it just came, it came out a plaid color. Do you miss the show? I miss the camaraderie of, of that. And, and the show was, you know, you... you you miss it. Yeah. Yes, I do. I do. I do miss it. But it, it's it's like something that you you realize it, it can't last forever. You you can't be in high school uh, forever. You know. And we got eight years out of that, and that was a good. That was a good eight years. And it was the only. I you know I had just moved to California from New York, so all of my previous work from home improvement before home improvement was usually theater, and you'd get you know six weeks, a couple of months. And then you'd move on to the next show, and that seemed like the norm. And you're in a show, and you're looking for the next job. You're always looking for work. And when I got home improvement, I was like, "Well, I should figure out what's what's the next." You know what? what and and I go, "Well, I'm, gosh, I'm coming back next year. Uh, I, uh, do I take some time? Well, you know, and then and then time uh, something will come up, a little movie or something, and 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 you you keep working. But there was kind of a relaxed feel about okay I, you know i'm not as desperate to find the next thing right now which so many people in the business are but you know in in a sense you you you, you want to capitalize on it but uh, my son cooper was also born the first season so all of a sudden i didn't want to do theater where i was gone every night so i, I would kind of like shy away from that and i, I didn't want to go off and, and be you know leave my wife tootie holding the well, yes, <laughs> holding our baby. <laughs> yes. Um, how often do you see Tim or talk to him? I, you know, uh, it, it comes in bunches, and then there, there might be a couple of months where I don't talk to him. But, but uh, we've stayed in touch. You're friends. We're friends, and we did a show uh, last year or two years ago. Um, power. That his, more power. Well, Is it that? started out as assembly required. 
for the History Channel, and it was a competition. And then they decided they didn't like the competition. I thought the competition was hysterical. You know, but on on the the darker side of a competition building show is you're asking these guys to do something quickly and they can get hurt. You can get hurt. You know, you're you're dealing with sharp objects and you're hurrying. That you know maybe isn't like the smartest thing, but they they changed it to then more power where it was just Tim and I talking. What did you take? What skill did you take? Was there a skill to be taken from home improvement? Oh, oh my gosh! With tools, there, there were so many. There were there were life skills. There were um, relationship skills. There were uh, acting, uh, and, and it's, it was just like this um, st- starter class in amazing things. Uh, one of the bigger things was was learning how to talk to writers, which wasn't something in my you know my milieu. I uh, when I did a play. I, I didn't necessarily work with the writer of the play. You know, Shakespeare's gone, Neil Simon. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I wasn't at that caliber or whatever. So you wouldn't mess around with those lines. It's written. This is, you know, we're not going to change this. And then all of a sudden, Home Improvement, we're changing lines on a daily basis. And, and uh, oh, that joke didn't work. And, I, and I, I would defend their work. I go, no, no, this is a good joke. I just didn't do it right. Give me one more day. Just give me a day. They go, okay, but you know, I don't think it works here. And sometimes it did. And they go, oh, okay, well, yeah, you did that. You did that a little different thing. It works. Yeah, okay, we'll keep that. And sometimes it's like, no, we'll move on to something else. But talking to writers, um, you know, from an actor's point of view, is, um, is a skill. Uh, and then just, just acting in front of a, of a camera instead of on stage. You don't have to be that big. You don't have to, uh, you know, get to the last seat. Although uh, the transition was nicely uh, facilitated because we had the show was a show within the show, so we had a live audience that we would play to, as as well as the home. So it, there wasn't a, necessarily always a fourth wall, but uh, that helped. Tim mentioned on a podcast, I think, the other day, that they might. <laughs> retool home improvement yeah i know I, that's that urban legend's been going on for for forever forever and I, I you know i would i would love it and be afraid of it at the same time because can you can you recreate that or is it just going to be weird uh you you know you want you're going to have to have some really really amazing writing very very interesting writing to uh bring these people back and and make and make them, you know, the audience trusts us. But if if we come back with stories that aren't, uh, you know, that compelling, yeah, compelling, um, we could lose it very quickly. Um, but I would, I, you know, I would love that. Uh, you know, the the backstory f- for that is is that um, w- the Wind Dancer, the producers, um, was Matt Williams, David McFadzian, and Carmen Finestra. And they had a uh, production company called Wind Dancer. And you'll see it at the end of the show. And they were brought on by, by Disney's TV arm, which was Buena Vista Television, to get together and create a show and sell it to ABC. And that's what they did. And then about two years into the run, <laughs> Disney bought ABC. And now there, there's like this... Just this little conflict of interest. We we think maybe we'd like to um, buy the show for less. And w- Wind Dancer's going, no. We can sell it for more. It's a hit. We can go to CBS. We can go to NBC. And so there's there's been a little thing there oh. for 25 years. Um, how did you first get the job? I, I gosh. I, um, you know... Many things in our in our world, in our life, we can walk back. You can go, oh, you know what? This happened because of this or because I met this person or because I did, the, you know. And I, I walked this back all the way to Michigan, to Holland, Holland, Michigan, where I did summer theater uh, with a, a director. We did a play called Strider. And we, we kind of butted heads because what I didn't realize at the time is he had just directed it for his college in Evansville. So I think he was trying to recreate that. And, you know, being a young actor, it's like, 
I don't get what, why you want me to do that. It's just like, and he, you know, he wouldn't say, well, that's what the other actor did. I, I found this out later. I go, um, I'm thinking this, you know, we would kind of butt heads and then, and then the show opened and it was great. You know, all of our ideas worked and he, and we became friends. And then a few years later, he calls me up and goes, there's a, a playwrights conference in, in, um, New Harmony, Indiana. And they need actors to read plays in progress. Would you be interested? And I go, well, and I'm living in you know New York City. Granted, my apartment is very cheap. I I, I have had a blessed uh, life. So I so the overhead in New York was was not that great. But um, to go to to go to uh, New Harmony, Indiana for two weeks for a hundred dollars a week stipend. I w we'll take care of food and drink but and and at that point you know um, my career was based on yes yes I'll do that so I did it and I met Matt Williams David McFadden they were part of the New Harmony project I didn't know who they were really except that they had just come off the first season of Roseanne which um, I, I knew the show Roseanne I didn't watch a lot of television but I knew that sh show was like a big hit but and, but they had gotten fired <laughs> And um, I, and we became great friends we're working on this, and and I convinced them to do skit a skit of all the different people in this thing. It'll be very funny at the end. We can just do the skit lampooning, you know, this director, this actor, whatever. Just have fun. And we're like up till one thirty, two o'clock in the morning writing this. Never in my life, if I had known what they had gone through or what they go through when they're writing a show. They're up till two, three o'clock in the morning. This is supposed to be vacation for them, and I'm like, let's write a let's write a skit, uh, you know. But we did that, and we had a great time, and and we became friends. So, when I then moved to California, a couple of years later, I called them up. I said, you know, I, these are these are contacts now, uh, even though they're friends. Networking. That I've networked, and I can call them up. And they were doing a show with Carol Burnett called Carolyn Company and they said well if something comes up you know we have a, a Carolyn Company there's a company of other actors that do everything else but every once in a while there's like a little thing and they called me up and I did a little thing where I was a grip uh, you know on a TV news show or whatever and I I got to stand up at, at curtain call with Carol Burnett you know I hold her hand it's Carol Burnett uh, and then I'm doing um, Shakespeare Shakespeare's Scottish play and I've only been in town about a year, just under a year and a half. And a friend of mine from school had put together a theater program, or a, a theater in a church, the First Baptist Church of Beverly Hills. Uh, probably the only Baptist church in Beverly in Hills. Beverly Hills. <laughs> but it, it, uh, we did uh, Shakespeare's Scottish play. And the bad luck that I had associated with that was getting a traffic ticket. I went to traffic school. And I sat next to a woman who was an agent who told me that these guys are auditioning for a TV show. And that's how, I, that's how I found out. I, so I called them. I said, and they go, no, there's nothing for you. Which, you know, we know that in this business, there, there really is nothing, nothing is ever for you until you're Tom Cruise or Robert Redford or, or whatever. Then everything's for you. Uh, but nothing was for me. There, there was a neighbor and there was a uh, Glenn, uh, Tim's assistant, Glenn, which we had already cast with Stephen Topolowski. Uh, who was in Groundhog Day, right? The life insurance, and, and but come in and audition, and I went in and I auditioned. I made them laugh. I knew the director, John Pasquin, because I'd been a reader for him in New York. W one of the weird things I did uh, when he was casting uh, Basketball di uh, Diaries at uh, Arena Stage, and the only person I didn't know was Debbie Barilski, our cast, uh, the casting director, and so I went in and I made them laugh. And I, uh, we had a scene where I'm, I'm <laughs> working with a lathe, and I thought, okay, you know, I'm going to make the lathe sound. You know, why not? Who cares? You know, so I'm, I'm doing the scenes as well. Now, when you're working with a lathe, you know, you, what you want, you know, and then <laughs> they were laughing. And at the end, John Pasquin goes, hey, can you make that lathe sound like a question? And I go, yeah. Yeah, I can. I'm an actor. So, you know, when you're working, you know, and they, they were, I went, well, I, you know, I scored there. I, I didn't know about Tim's grunt at the time, but the, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, you know, he was, they were just having fun with me because I'm 
amenable to that. And I walked away thinking, what a great audition that was. Maybe um, something, you know, like I did with Carol Burnett will come up. And, I, and, and then Carmen Finestra, um, one of the guys, calls me and goes, so Rick, do you still have that beard? And I'd grown the beard for the Shakespeare show. You know, it's like usually I didn't have a beard because at my age that didn't seem uh, commercial, you know, they, or whatever I was thinking. And I go, yeah, I do. Said, well, um, Stephen got a movie. And I go, yeah. And he can't do the pilot. Oh, would you mind doing just the pilot? And I go, why Why would I? Mi yes, of course I would love to do that. Because your career was built on yes. Because I, I, well, and, and it was a pilot. Right. I hadn't, hadn't done anything, any television of, of worth or, or, or anything. So, yes, I will do this pilot, no problem. And, uh, you know, I go to work, and it's we've got like a 10-day rehearsal thing. And the mother is Frances Fisher, originally. That's why the boys are blonde. She was kind of strawberry blonde. And we do like three days of rehearsal and then that little audience comes in and then she's gone. And I freaked out. I was like, what? you know, and I, I go to Dave and I go, D or Carmen, what happened? Says, it wasn't right. I go, what do you, what do you mean it wasn't right? We were getting laughs. The show was, was great. It was, it, you know, and Francis is really good. It wasn't, it wasn't right. I go, well, I don't know. Okay. I, I, I don't. And they brought in Pat Richardson. And Pat, they, they had talked to Pat before, but she was going to do another show called, um, boy, this is a lot of information, isn't it? <laughs> she was going to do another show called Home Movies, which was the continuation of The Wonder Years, They're at, at them at 35. So she and um, uh, Daniel Stern, who did the voiceover for Wonder Years, were going to do that. And then he decided he didn't want to do television, and all of a sudden she became uh, available again, and she came in and... And after like a day, two days, we had another little audience and it was, it was different. You know, what Carmen had said was, was that, uh, you know, there was a point in the, in the, um, <clears throat> in the pilot where Tim wants to charge up or, or make the dishwasher more powerful. Right. And so she has to go out and she turns them and she goes, don't touch the dishwasher. And the audience, you know, with Francis went, oh, God, yeah, he better not. He better not. Oh, no. Oh, is he going to do that? You know, and, and with Pat, when she said, don't touch the dishwasher. And they're going, yeah, he's going to do that. It's going to, oh, this is great. It was like she was, she wasn't a victim to Tim. She was his equal is, is what I, I assume is, it was the difference. And another life lesson. You know, sometimes it's not about how good of an actor you are. It's about... Um, how things are perceived. And right place, right time. Right place, right time. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I was, and there I was. Right place, right time. But I only got to do the pilot. And Stephen was going to come back and do the thing. But then a month goes by because we did it in April and they didn't start back up. In, if, the, if the show gets picked up, then they'll start in like late July. And right before that, I get a call and go, oh, we might need you for a couple of episodes. And I go, great. Because now Tootie and I are pregnant. Both of you? Well, well, I've I helped. I know I know that I helped in there, but you know, and we're apartment managers and caterers, and and I'm going. Oh, you know, everything everything helps. A couple of episodes will be wonderful. Thank you, thank you. I, I'm there. I'm absolutely there. That's great. Yeah. When you were doing the show, did you feel the gradual uh, popularity growing with it? Could you notice it outside when you went places and people yes. came up to you? Yes. Um, you know, for the f for the first maybe two or three or four epi three episodes, four episodes, we hadn't aired yet. So when I was doing it with Tim as a guest star, because Stephen was going to come in, the audience didn't know who we were. They hadn't seen us. They didn't, you know, they didn't have an idea of, of our of what we no were. No attachment. Yeah. And so they're, it's like we're doing a play, in a, in a way. Yeah, you know, it's fresh. And and whatever I do or however I react to Tim, is, you know, the audience reacts to that. And the writers started watching that, and and it was, like, uh, they watched 
that and then wrote to that. So in a sense, I was I was a, a part of the creation of what Al eventually became. Um, and that was that was really lovely. And that got me the job. It, eventually, they all of a sudden saw the relationship with Tim and Al that they could write to that uh, over what they had envisioned with Tim and Glenn. Um, uh, so that was kind of a cool thing. But then once we started airing, it was slowly, I, I didn't know how to deal with that. Um, and that's not in school. That's, that's, not, that's not something they teach you. You know, now you have social media and you can, you can go to everybody who talks about how they have to deal with it or the first time or like that. But back then, that wasn't ever talked about or discussed. Or, or if it was, I wasn't reading those magazines or those interviews or whatever. And people started, would, would come up and, and it was almost like, I'm not worthy. So I would, I would deflect. I go, no, I, I look like the guy, but I'm not that guy. And, and then I, you know, I'm an apartment manager. I get a phone call that our, uh, one of our tenants, his, his, uh, kitchen sink is, is stopped up. Can, can I take a look? I go, yeah, yeah, I can fix that. That's no problem. I, I know that. And so I go down there and I open the, he opens the door and there's like 15 of his friends are in there. You see Al Borland's our uh, apartment manager. And I go back to my wife and I go, it's time we get rid of our day job. We don't need this day job right now. And because uh, it was free rent, which, you know, when you think about it was my rent was $900. So it was $900 a month I was getting paid. <laughs> so your life changed. So the life changed. And then more and more people. Yeah. And now it's like, it's not about me anymore. It's about people's, growing up watching the show with their grandparents or with their parents or, you know, and, and they were kids and they're growing up. And I was just in Grand Rapids just last week. And, oh, my gosh, the, I, I, the people that would come up, uh, you know, oh, I, I can't believe you're here. Do you live here? You know, wherever I am, people just assume that's where I live. So, oh, you must live here, right? Especially if I'm in Michigan. Or well, and T Tim's from Detroit, isn't he, originally? He, just a little bit outside. He was in Beverly Hills, Detroit. <laughs> Is there a Baptist church there? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there there are many churches, uh, you know, in, in the Detroit greater area. The word Baptist just doesn't seem to go with Beverly Hills, having grown <laughs> up the son of a Baptist minister. Ah, ah. Uh, I uh, know that stuff. So how's your dance moves? <laughs> what dance moves? Well, and I, don't ask me to play cards. Uh, oh, okay. All right. We couldn't do that. No. And I don't smoke anymore. Um, well, there and you I don't go. drink. Well, there, there's your poker face right there. <laughs> there's my, I there's don't my smoke, Dad. Baptist upbringing. More with Richard Karn in a moment. Pam came up to me one day and she goes, you know, I'm, I, I don't think I'm going to do any more uh, layouts for Hef. And then literally a week later, she goes, well, I'm going to do another loud for how why he says well he's got these other pictures and i don't like them and he's going to use them if i don't do this he felt you know he was the star but he didn't feel like he was pulling his weight necessarily and if they can afford to buy their parents a house mm. um th there's a, a weird uh, a weird balance. thing balance did you have a hard time holding it together tim is kind of a comic genius and he's very quick he is, and and that was fun to watch. I hadn't been around a, a stand up, and and I'm watching him talk, you know, uh, off, uh, you know, uh, in between stuff, and just something that would happen to him on the way home, would all of a sudden be hysterical, and as he would grow it during the day, uh, you know, just little stuff that that happened to him was was um, turned into his act, almost in in a way, and he was very nervous about being an actor. With you know Pat's an accomplished actor, Earl, who played Wilson, is has been been on the stage and movies and and me and and he he felt you know he was the star, but he didn't feel like he was pulling his weight necessarily. But he he was. I, I mean, the, my God, they used most of his act in the pilot. They kept adding things from. It. It's, 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 that's my act. You're 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 putting into the pilot. Well, I'm going to run out of things to to say. Just, well, you know, they're funny and they and they apply and this and that. But um, watching Tim work and then and then working off off of him, we had a great time and we would laugh. 
you know, if there was something funny, we would hold it together as long as we could, and then we would laugh. Um, and oh my, oh my God, I remember a, an episode where he's showing me, a, a, you know, the router. We're going to use the router, and and you know, Al is like, well, Tim, you want you want to be sure that the. Uh, you know the router can can uh, yeah. he's, Al Al yeah I know and, and then he <laughs> puts the and he clicks and then goes and he's like all over the place. I literally thought I laughed. I I hurt. I thought I was laughing and and you know cut and I go I I'm so sorry. And he says what? I I laughed. He says and we go back and we look at the play, and I'm like, there was nothing there, but I inside I was exploding. Uh, I used to run into him all the time at the Hollywood YMCA. He worked out there. Yeah. And I was there every morning, and he would see me on the Stairmaster. And <laughs> I'm a person who sweats a lot. And uh, one year, doing the Emmy Awards uh, in Pasadena in September, which is awfully hot. Yeah. I was under my tuxedo sweating. I Black sweat guy. through my shirt. And Tim came by, and he said, did you just come from the gym? <laughs> no, no. He, I, I liked him a great deal. He's very funny. Yeah. Uh, did you know how big a star he'd become? Not really. Uh, I mean, they told me that there was a stand-up and that he had a um, a, sh a Showtime thing. So I watched the Showtime Men Are Pigs tour, and I'm watching this, and I'm going, "Oh God, that's funny. That's funny." And then. Um, sometime during the first season, he did the uh, amphitheater up at Universal, and we all went to see that. And it, it was like a different person on stage. It was it was really interesting to watch. It was Tim, but he was in a suit, and he you know his persona was just you know um, uh, way more professionally funny or, or whatever. So um, at that point. I, I didn't know I, I knew he was the you know he was the reason that the show happened uh, but I I, I, I I you know I hadn't thought about it in those in those terms I was still just damn glad to be there I was having a great time I, you know um, try you know trying to be helpful trying to be funny I don't upstage but you know still get your laughs yeah yep what was it like? Do you remember working with uh, Pamela Anderson? Pam was uh, so pretty without makeup. I, that was the f what, what astonished me was the first time we went out to some event and she shows up in this like this makeup. And I go, "What are you doing?" She goes, "Well, this is what I you know this is what I do. Yeah, you know this, this is this is this is what sells." And I go, "God, you're so pretty without all that makeup." She goes, "Well, you know," and she's from a little town that that uh, you know I grew up. We we were my grandfather had a boat and we would go up into the Canadian San Juans from from out of Seattle and we go up the inland sea and she lived in a little town that that had a dock and maybe a a, a post office and a grocery store. Um, it was uh, oh silver silver uh, it was a, on Vancouver Island, mm. uh, Ladysmith, Ladysmith, and um, she was she was very chatty. She, she, I remember she came up to me one day and, and she goes, you know, I'm, I, I don't think I'm going to do any more uh, layouts for Hef. And I go, good. Good for you. I don't, I, I, I don't think you need to anymore. I mean, you're doing this. You, you, you're fine now. And she goes, yeah. You know, and then literally a week later, she goes, well, I'm going to do another layout for Hef. I go, why? She says, well, he's got these other pictures and I don't like them and he's going to use them if I don't do this. And, and I went, oh, okay. And it seemed like one of those Hollywood movies where <laughs> it's just, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> she's doing a phase. She's going through a phase now. I've seen quite a few pictures of her where she's going out without any makeup on. And she should have done it 30 years ago. But now she still looks fine. She yes. still looks great. You know. But if you're used to her the other way, she looks different. Yeah, but for a while. I mean, there's a... And then you get used to it. Yeah. Uh, did you know how big a star she'd become? Her life became not her own. Yeah, and for a while well, there. Well, you know, not that she was stifled as the tool time girl, but there there wasn't a lot that was going to happen for her. I, I didn't think. I didn't think they were going to take a storyline. Uh, but she wanted to be Pambo. She, you know, she goes, I think, you know, this this character can do, you know, this and that and and and. I, I, and I think that's maybe where Barb Wire came from. 
you know she wanted right. she wanted to be a superhero in, in a sense um, I was at the Cannes Film Festival the year they were marketing barbed wire and she came dressed in yeah it was like oh my god look at her you know yeah. but she was lovely I mean she was really great and very sweet yeah how about Jonathan Taylor Thomas the boys the boys were were nine and seven the, the the two boys were the older or the the youngest one was was seven who turns out to be the tallest, obviously because his dad was tall. But um, uh, Jonathan just knew how to tell a joke. He was like this old soul, and I would watch that and I go, oh wow, the writers they want their jokes to work, so we'll we'll give Jonathan the you know the ones that have payoffs. And the other kids struggled for a little bit to get something. Timing. To get timing, yeah, because they're nine, right? You know, and Jonathan came out of the box at thirty, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But but also he, you know, he was cute and adorable, and you know, I I, I feel like, um, you know, young child actors have this weird sense of of growing up. Their you know their egos and ids are are being developed at, at that age, and and if they can afford to buy their parents a house. Mm. Um, th- there's a, a weird, uh, a weird balance. thing. Balance, balance. You know, if you if you can find that balance. Would you tell me that story again about uh, golfing with Bob Hope and Gerald Ford and what oh, happened afterwards? God, that was so great. It's, that was it is a great so story. fabulous. Well, I, I um, the first time I got invited to the Bob Hope, I couldn't go because we were working. It was in January, and that was one of the weeks we were working. And then the next year. I asked them, can, can we take this week off? Because we would do two weeks on or three weeks on, two weeks off, week off. And they go, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and so I was able to do the Bob Hope. And I, and I was very excited because this is like a, a cool golf event. And my sister up in Seattle, she calls up and goes, Rick, I understand you're playing with Bob Hope. And I go, no, no, I'm playing in the Bob Hope, which is very cool. I want you to know this. It's very cool, but I'm, I i don't think I'm playing with Bob Hope. And I get up there, and, and I go, so who am I playing with? Um, you're in Mr. Hope's foursome. And I go, oh, God, now i got to tell my sister she was right. Uh, and and uh, Gerald Ford, and I went, the president? Yes, Gerald Ford. And your first, you have four pros. The first day will be Kenny Perry, which was um, the winner from last year. The second day is Tom Kite. The third day is Arnold Palmer. Oh, my. And the fourth day is no Fuzzy name. Zeller. I, and it was like a fantasy golf camp every day. Uh, and I brought my dad and my father-in-law. And we're walking down the fairway with my dad and Arnold Palmer. And my, <laughs> my dad, you know, he's a, he's a builder. He's a contractor from Seattle, Washington. And he looks at me and he goes, you know, I never in, never in my wildest dreams would I think I would be walking down a fairway with Arnold Palmer and the president, and I go, stick with me, kid. <laughs> and you, and you, you, you're fond of golf to begin with. I, I am. I, which all came out of that Hope Summer Rep back in Michigan, because um, I worked with an actor whose wife was a big star in soap operas, Kim Zimmer, um, and AC Weary uh, came in to direct uh, Matchmaker. I was doing the, the. Straight version of Hello Dolly. Thornton Wilder. Thornton Wilder is the matchmaker. And um, he said, yeah, you know, we, we get invi- vo- invited to these golf tournaments and they give you golf clubs and shoes. And I go, oh, God, wouldn't that be great? You know, and this is 10 years before any of this is, t- is happening. And I go, like, yeah, that sounds fun. And, and so we started playing golf. And, and uh, you know, y- 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 you have to pay attention to get any better at golf. And and put in some time, and I did. I put in the time. And on a golf course, just the four of you, you you tend to talk to people. Yes. Gerald Ford invited you to the White House. <laughs> well, not to the White House, um, but I, I get a letter. I get a letter the week later from from Mr. Ford uh, saying, "Dear Rich, Betty and I would love to host you if you come into the into the uh, um, desert." Uh, you know, any time. And, and, and I went, wow, that's really nice of him. And a week later, I get another letter saying, Dear Rick, and my secretary tells me you don't go by Rich. 
and I have I have those both of those letters, you know, tucked away somewhere. I, I just I'd frame them. I I should. I really should. You know, put it on my wall of shame or fame or whatever we're going to call it. But um, he, he it was really fun, and his son was on his back, so his son was was his caddy. And the actually the his detail his his uh, secret service secret detail? service guys called me up later and and wanted to play at Lakeside and so I I played with them you know like a year later or whatever. That's great. That's a great story. I know. I, I, um, I had my own golf tournament for for eighteen years because I was going to other people's charity events. I thought, well, I should do something up in Seattle, you know, for the hospital that my mom had her cancer treatments with so I did the the Fred Hutch and the Overlake Hospital uh, not knowing that you don't you don't pair a, a, a large hospital with a small hospital and then f- split it 50 50 but that's what I did I said well, that's what I want to do and um, there were some growing pains there <laughs> you know but we worked it out you know they understood that that I was bringing them something that they didn't have in their usual fundraising live and world, learn world but uh, you know I had I, you know, I had Sam Jackson there for seven years. I, I had um, uh, Bill Gates, and and I, I put him with with Meatloaf and Sam Jackson, and they had a great time. And and then Chris McDonald shows up. He doesn't have shoes. He doesn't know even know how to play golf. And we teach him, and we give him all this stuff. And then he ends up being you know Shooter McGavin. How many years later? So, well. That was fun. That was a lot of fun. And we raised a lot of money for the charities. Mr. Karn, thank you very much. I've enjoyed this. This was, this was lovely. I appreciate it. If, uh, if all interviews were just this kind of a conversation. That's what I like. That's how I like to do them. Yeah. That's how you got that Emmy over? Oh, those, those aren't mine. Oh. Those are both his. <laughs> oh, there's more. There's more. He's being modest. <laughs> Well, okay. I, I'll, I'll have to go and check out the bathroom. <laughs> but uh, thank you for Probably having me on your show. holding the door open. Yeah. Well, what else do you do with them? You hold grapefruits. Where did I, see, I think I saw Olivia Coleman on the Graham Norton show talking about how she used her Oscar to hold open the bathroom door to prop it open. I don't think I'd do that with an Oscar, but who knows? Well, if it's heavy enough. Yeah. Well, this was fun. Thank you very much. All right. Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All things technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein. Lichtenstein.